Welcome back to University United Methodist Church in East Lansing, Michigan, where we are daring each other to love God and our neighbor. We are an inclusive congregation and we welcome everyone at this church. And I hope that when we resume our in-person worship services, you will join us if you have not actually been here with us at University UMC. My name is Bill. I am the lead pastor here at University and I welcome you this morning. Thank you for your continuing support of the church financially during this very unusual time. We continue to receive your generous gifts electronically through Venmo and also in the U.S. mail. Your continued financial support of the church is very much appreciated. If you know someone who doesn't use Facebook, but they would like to see our worship services and can do that on Venmo, direct them to our church website, universitychurchhome.org. There they can simply click on the YouTube link and even subscribe to that page, as well as be notified when the services are uploaded to YouTube. And they can tune in there rather than on Facebook. I will be facilitating a book group on Zoom to discuss Robin D'Angelo's book, white fragility, why it is so hard for white people to talk about racism. This will begin on Tuesday evening, September 8th at 7 p.m. It will repeat the following Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. So you have an option to attend one or both Tuesday evening or Wednesday afternoon session. Email me at bbills at E-L-U-U-M-C dot O-R-G if you would like to be on the Zoom email invitation list for this book discussion group. You will need to download the Zoom software. If you need any help with that, please telephone me at the church office and I can give you instructions on how to download Zoom. Our next parking lot Communion service will be on Thursday, September 17th, and that will be at 7 p.m. Please bring your mask and your lawn chair. Ann Arnsmeyer will now lead us in today's call to worship. Let us now read responsively this morning's call to worship. Have you heard the good news? Christ calls us to be people of light. Have you felt the good news? Christ offers us God's love and grace. Have you lived the good news? Christ lives in us when we gather in his name. Come, let us worship the Lord. One, two, one, two, three. Some glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. shall never end I'll fly away
Andrew. Please join me now in the opening prayer. Merciful God, help us become the people you created us to be. We yearn to build communities of love, but it is easier to tear down than to build up. We long for the healing of the nations, but it is easier to harm than to heal. We want to bear our grief with dignity, but it is satisfying to parade our wounds for all to see. Bind up our spirits, gracious God, so that we might reconcile with those who have caused us pain. Help us to cast aside the things that chain our spirits, that we might be free to care for one another and fulfill your love, the law of love. Amen. Hi, friends. Happy Sunday. I'm so glad you're here. You know, when I was a little girl, we spent a lot of summer weekends, especially holiday weekends like this one, visiting my grandma and grandpa. We lived just outside of Chicago, but my grandma and grandpa lived here in Michigan, um, kind of here in the meaty part of your hand map. They lived near Kalamazoo and they had a great big house with lots of bedrooms and a couple of boats to enjoy on the lake. But it wasn't the boats or the bedrooms or the house that we came to visit. It was grandma and grandpa. It didn't matter if we got there at midnight or six in the morning. Grandma and Grandpa had the light on and were ready and waiting to welcome us in with hugs and kisses and maybe try and fix us a meal. When I was very little, I liked to sleep at the foot of Grandma and Grandpa's bed. And so Grandma would pull out a little cot and fix it with blankets and a pillow just for me. It meant I didn't have to share a bedroom with my brother or my parents. And it also meant that I got some one-on-one -on -one time with grandma and grandpa first thing in the morning. I'd crawl into bed and snuggle with them. And in their bathroom, grandma had a special powder puff that was just for me. And if grandma knew you were coming and she knew you had a favorite something that she made, a favorite dessert or a favorite meal, you could be sure that it was on the menu, probably already made and in the refrigerator ready to go before you ever got there. Grandma's kitchen was the only place on earth where as a child I could walk in and announce that I was hungry 10 minutes before dinner and get a bowl of mini marshmallows in response. It was pretty magical and wonderful being there. Grandma especially worked really hard to make sure that everybody who came in the doors of their home felt welcome and special and loved. And it wasn't just family, it was friends and neighbors and friends of their family. They were really good at welcoming and making people feel wanted and special. There's a word for that that sometimes we use in church called hospitality. But today's scripture is all about welcome. And I wanted to share this with you. It comes from the book of Matthew again, which means that it is a gospel. 
uh, which tells the story of Jesus life. It's in the New Testament. And these are red letter scriptures. If you remember, red letter means that these are words that they think Jesus said. So this is Matthew 10 verses 40 through 42. Those who welcome you are also welcoming me. And those who welcome me are welcoming the one who sent me. Those who welcome a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who welcome a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. I assure you that everybody who gives even a cup of cold water to these little ones because they are my disciples will certainly be rewarded. So let's talk about that a little bit. Those who welcome you, and he's talking to the disciples, are also welcoming me. So anyone who welcomes the disciples welcomes Jesus. And then he goes on to say, those who welcome me are also welcoming the one who sent me. And who sent Jesus? Well, God did. This was really important because the disciples often traveled from town to town, and they didn't have tents, and they didn't have places to stay in every town. And so if people welcomed the disciples in, it meant that they were allowing that ministry of Jesus, that good news into their home and into the community. And then it goes on to say, those who welcome a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Actually, we hear the word reward three different times in this scripture. What kind of reward could Jesus be talking about? That's confusing. I mean, maybe the disciples would give a little bit of money to the homes that they stayed in, but probably not. I wonder what kind of reward Jesus could be talking about. See, because we know from another place in the Bible that God's grace isn't something that we earn by doing. It's given to us. Here, this comes from the book of Ephesians. Uh, this is chapter 2, verse 8. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. So we know that the reward isn't heaven. We know that it's probably not money. So what do you think that reward could be? Well, I will tell you that when I think about my grandma welcoming people to her home and making them feel special, she didn't do it to win an award or have a reputation. The work of welcoming people, of having people in her home, of taking care of people, that gave her joy. That was a reward when people wanted to be with them and share space and time with them. I think that it's a little bit like that for us too, as disciples, when we do kind things to help take care of other people, we do it for Jesus and we do it for God. And that can be its own reward. Have you ever done something kind and felt warm and good afterwards just because you know you did the right thing? Those sorts of actions that we take to welcome people and take care of people, that draws us closer to God and being close to God feels really good. So I think maybe that when Jesus is talking about the rewards that people will receive, when they welcome disciples, when they offer a glass of cool water to someone, the reward is getting to know God. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? I wonder how you could think of welcoming people in your life when we can't share a space with them. What would that mean to you? Hmm something to ponder. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for your love and grace that we could not earn. You give it to us every day freely. 
And Lord, we thank you for the words of Jesus that help to remind us that when we take care of one another, we are taking care of him too. Lord, help us to feel welcoming and help us know the reward of being close to you and acting in ways that share your love. Be with us this week. Help us be hospitable to those that we encounter online or in person. And remind us that you are with us always and love us no matter what. Amen. Bye, friends. Have a great week. Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 10, 40 through 42. Hear now these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever becomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. For the past two Sundays, Matthew's gospel has dealt with questions of who Jesus is and what it means to follow Jesus. And Matthew answers those questions for us. Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus sided with the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. Jesus spoke truth to power Jesus confronted evil and injustice and prejudice. Jesus said the first would be last and the last would be first. And his disciples are told that they are to take up their crosses even as Jesus did and follow him. His mission is very serious. And following Jesus is serious mission work. But on the other hand, it can also be pretty simple, as we see in the gospel reading for today, for ushering in the kingdom of God is as simple as offering hospitality. Ushering in the kingdom of God is as simple as practicing Christ-like compassion. Welcoming the other, the stranger, the foreigner, the immigrant, anyone in need of hospitality, doing these things is a sign that the kingdom of God has drawn near. And so a simple act, offering a cup of cold water to someone in need, is Christ-like compassion. And that compassion is simple, necessary, and Christ-like. Two weeks ago, you might remember that Jesus impressed upon Peter and us that the right words are not enough. Words must be accompanied by right actions. Salvation can be yours simply by acting with compassion. Salvation here in the text for today is offered as the reward for simply treating others with love, kindness, and compassion, no questions asked. You don't have to say the sinner's prayer. You don't have to be consumed by guilt. You just have to act in the ways that Jesus acted. You just have to care about the people that Jesus cares about in the ways that Jesus cared about them. This can be as easy as giving someone who is thirsty a cup of water. But for many, even for many who claim to be Christian, There are limits on hospitality, trails of hope and terror, 
is a film about immigration by Miguel De La Torre. De La Torre is a United Methodist and professor of Christian ethics. You might remember that he spoke here at our church at Keep Making Peace a couple of years ago. He and his son made a movie about Latinx migrants traveling northward to the United States border. In his film, one of the things that Miguel de la Torre documents is the work of Christian missionary groups taking water out into the desert at the border and leaving it for migrants who have walked hundreds of miles. This water is nothing less than a life-saving gift. An armed United States Border Patrol agent is filmed in that movie, cursing the Christians while using his knife to puncture their water jugs. And as the life-saving gift of water drains out onto the desert floor, the U.S. Border Patrol agent threatens the Christians with arrest. Apparently, Christian compassion is viewed as a criminal act at the United States southern border. The chief complaint against Jesus was, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Jesus welcomed and fed those whom the self-righteous religious people called unclean, dirty, sinful, sick, and even mentally ill. These religious people rationalized their rejection of Jesus and their lack of compassion and hospitality for people in dire need. You know, maybe I am meddling now and not preaching. I know that nobody likes their hypocrisy pointed out, even me. But we will not ever get better if we don't deal with our own stuff. We won't ever know salvation if we don't deal with our own stuff. And so Jesus pointed out hypocrisy in his government, and Jesus pointed out hypocrisy in his own religious institutions. But those institutions chose to reject him. They chose death over grace. They chose rejection over compassion. Now, I'm not saying just throw open the borders and let the country be overrun by immigrants. But I do believe that if we really are the greatest nation on earth, then we should be able to come up with an immigration system that is both just and compassionate. And I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus would never say, blessed are those who separate children from their parents and house them in cages. Where is the Christ-like compassion in that kind of an immigration policy? On Judgment Day, there will be some in our United States government who will have to face an accounting for unjust, inhumane, and oppressive policies. Now, I want to remind you that Jesus said, and we've already covered this, Jesus said that following him would cause division. He asks people to make choices. And some people choose Christ-like compassion, while others choose to let people die in the desert while keeping children in cages. Jesus doesn't have to really do much to divide America. We are doing a fine job of that by ourselves. Millions of people in this country are fond of saying, America first. Many Christians believe that ours is God's chosen nation. They believe in the doctrine of American exceptionalism. But please remember that Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. 
If you want to become greatest of all, Jesus said, you must be willing to become the least of all and servant of all. Jesus said, from those to whom much has been given, even more will be required. God sends prophets to show us that God is present and working among us. Historically, though, throughout the Bible, the people of God have not appreciated prophets pointing out their hypocrisy. And so the people of God reject the prophets of God. The people of God always reject and kill their own prophets sent to them by God. We rejected Moses. We rejected Isaiah. We rejected Jeremiah and the other Hebrew prophets. And it continued to happen into modern times as we rejected Dr. King and others. It continues to this day. Nibs Stroop is a Presbyterian minister who works for social justice. Nibs relates that he was raised in the 1950s in a church in the Deep South. And in that church, he relates that in his Sunday school, in his youth group, and in Sunday worship services, he was taught over and over and over that God had ordained white people to rule over black people. He didn't learn that from the KKK. He didn't learn it from some white supremacist group. Nibs learned that from his preacher and his Sunday school teachers and his youth group leader. Nib Stroop said that the same Christian community that taught him how to be a loving, graceful, compassionate Christian also tried to teach him at the very same time that racism is the will of God. He goes on to share that later he learned that teaching the love of God along racism, alongside racism in church is nothing more than idolatry. The church that raised Nibs Stroop, by his own admission, was racist. And therefore, he says it was idolatrous. And so he had to unlearn much of his white Christian education. That was in the 1950s. But I believe that problem persists in white Christian churches in this country even to this day. Let me ask you a question. Why do you go to church? Why do you even tune in and listen to a preacher, especially one who's meddling? Why do you do that? I was in an airport one time waiting for a flight that was very late. It was delayed. And it was late in the evening and that place was crowded. There were people all over the place, not enough room to sit down even. And there was a little boy about five years old and he was tired and he was hungry and he was really acting out. And his parents were just at their wits end. And as the little guy's acting out, I hear the guy next to me kind of mutter under his breath and say, they should take that boy to church so he can learn how to behave himself. Is that why you go to church? To learn how to behave? There is a sense that the practice of Christianity should be about ethics how to behave. In the United Methodist Church, our baptism pledge says that we will resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves. And yeah, that even includes within the church. 
if, for example, the church is teaching racism. Someone once said that the line between good and evil runs right down the center of the human heart. I think it also runs right down the center of our nation. The line between good and evil runs right down the center of our policies on things like immigration and criminal justice. And yes, the line between good and evil runs right down the middle of some congregations in this country. And if you're not sure which side of the line you're on, check yourself. How do you behave? How are you treating other people? Are you carrying out Christ-like acts of mercy and compassion? Do you need and want to be first? Or do, do you believe that the first of all should be last? That the greatest of all should become least in the servant of all. Nibs Stroop also says that he believes that we are called as Christians to bring into the center the marginalized people of our society. He said that we are called to free ourselves from the demonic powers that distort individuals and communities. But bringing the marginalized into the center will no doubt bring conflict with the powers that be, whether it's in the government or in the church. That happened to Jesus. Jesus said the first will be last and the last first. Jesus said if you want to be the greatest, you have to become the least of all, a servant of all. Jesus would never, in my mind, ever say America first. I hope you do come to church to learn how to behave. I hope you come to learn how to practice radical hospitality. I hope you come to church to learn how to practice radical acceptance, radical forgiveness, radical compassion. I hope you come to church to learn how to be great by becoming the least of all and the servant of all. I hope you come to church so that you might become more like Jesus, more just, more merciful, more compassionate. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says that Jesus, when he saw the crowds, had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless, so he had compassion for them. Jesus took a side. Taking sides is a big deal. That's true. Because we typically say we want to be inclusive. It's true that we want to accept everyone. But it's also true that the line between good and evil runs right down the center of the human heart. The line between good and evil runs right down the center of our nation. And teaching racism will never glorify God. Harassing the helpless will never glorify God. Caging children at the southern border never glorifies God. Spreading fear and hatred with insults and lies does nothing to glorify God. Putting yourself first or putting America first is antithetical to the teachings of Jesus in the gospel, and it does not glorify God. Putting oneself first or putting one's nation first 
is simply what theologians call idolatry. Jesus said, whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones will not lose their reward. Even the smallest gestures of compassion do not go unnoticed by God. There is one God, there's one world, there's one race. The human race. That one God is sovereign over all. The one God is the creator of all. And each and every human being is loved by God and has been created in the image of God. Some of us are not more favored than others. Be it for the country we live in, the religion we practice, the color of our skin, or our political party affiliation. Do not be fooled by a false doctrine of white American Christian exceptionalism. Remember that from those to whom much has been given, even more will be required. If we are in fact exceptional, then our responsibilities to our fellow human being and the rest of the world, if we are exceptional, then our responsibilities for justice, mercy, and compassion must be exceptional. We are called to bring the marginalized into the center, even if we meet with resistance. We're called to sow seeds of compassion, not seeds of division. And if you sow seeds of compassion, no matter how small, you will not lose your reward. Amen. One, two, three.
As we turn to prayer now, you will see the names of the people for whom we have been asked to pray appear on your screen. And there are some new names that I would like to lift up to you today. The first is Chris Cook, who is suffering from mesothelioma, and also Brad Kesey. Brad is the husband of our former bishop, Deborah Kesey. Brad and Deborah, of course, attended church here at University United Methodist, and Brad was a member of our choir. He has been dealing with cancer for some time now, and it has come to our attention that uh, Brad's cancer has been diagnosed as terminal, and he is now receiving hospice care. So please pray for Brad and Bishop Deborah Kesey. And I'd also like you to pray for the 183,000 people, their families, in their communities, 183,000 people in this country who have lost their lives to COVID-19. Please pray for that great grief and loss being experienced across our nation. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, Hear us now as we come to you with hearts burdened with grief, hearts burdened with loss and the prospect of loss. Hear us now, O God, as we come to you with hearts burdened by uncertainty and anxiety. Hear us now, O God, as we reach out to you, asking for help, asking for hope, asking for a spirit of perseverance and trust. Fill us with faith, O God, so that in the midst of our uncertainties, in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our difficulties, we might be renewed in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies, and in our souls. Renew us with your life-giving grace. Fill us with the desire for peace. Fill us, O oh God, with a desire for justice. And fill us with hope for a better future, not only for ourselves and our families and our communities, but for this nation and for people all over this earth. We thank you, God, for this world that you have created, for the awesome majesty, beauty, diversity, and wonder. We thank you for your goodness, for your generosity. We pray that you would help us to be good stewards of every gift that you have given us. We pray to you, O oh God, for Chris, for Brad and for Bishop Deb and their family. We remember to you John Stahl and Claudette Parity. David Blakesley, Tony Vincent, Don Harrington, and William Scholes. We continue to pray for Howard and for his son Paul and grandson Mark. We ask that you would continue to bless and keep Irma. Grant that she might know that she is prayed for, loved, and missed by us. We pray for all who serve us in our military, leaders in public service. We pray for police, fire, and EMT personnel. 
for pharmacists, doctors, nurses, everybody who works in our hospitals, in our clinics. We pray for our veterans and for those who serve in our military. We lift up to you again, O oh God, Jane and Larry Keyes and their family and the work that they do for us and for you at Africa University. We pray your continued blessings upon our Bishop David and our Superintendent Jerry and our campus minister, Jim. Bless our city. Bless our communities. Bless our government and, oh God, bless us in this election season. We especially ask that you would bless all of those who are feeling the effects of the loss of 183,000 loved ones. And as we pray for their grief, we pray for millions of others in their time of illness. And we pray for your spirit of healing, that it might move in their bodies, in their minds, and in their spirits. We pray, God, for your spirit of healing, that it might move upon us, that it might move upon your church, and we pray for your spirit of healing, that it might move upon this nation, that we together might all become more just and more compassionate after the teaching and example of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as he taught us to pray to you together, so now we lift our voices as one, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that your lives might abound in hope this day and every day by the power of God's Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit which is alive and working in each one of you. Amen. Cut. Okay. Yeah, I'll just start over. Benediction, take one. Did I screw it up again? Can ever. Benediction, take three. Cut. I did that pretty good.